Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Our webinar today is Using the Eridus-3 Dissolvating Nebulizer System in Geochemistry. Our presenter is Fred Smith, Product Manager for Teledyne CTEC. Okay, Fred, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, as uh, Shelley indicated, today we're going to talk about one of the Teledyne CTEC accessories, the Aridus 3 Dissolvating Nebulizer. And we're going to look at the general operation of the system, the setup, and some applications in geochemistry. So um, the, the general uh, uh, setup for the system is we're going to combine a low flow inert pneumatic nebulizer, meaning that we we'll use a gas flow to generate a sample aerosol. And we'll combine that with a heated PFA spray chamber and a fluoropolymer membrane dissolvator and use this for liquid sample introduction to an ICPMS instrument. The instrument could be either a quadrupole system, a single uh, collector um, magnetic sector system, or a multi-collector system. But um, it's three main components um, that we're going to connect together. And we'll show you uh, this both in diagrams, uh, of course, and in pictures. Now, some of the benefits we're looking to get out of this type of a system of combining these three components is first the introduction of very corrosive liquid samples that may contain hydrofluoric acid meaning that we cannot have any silicon containing wetted parts, such as glass nebulizers or glass spray chambers. And this is particularly important in uh, geological samples that may contain silicon or in semiconductor samples. We're also looking at the introduction of low volume liquid samples, meaning samples that are often pre-concentrated. So there is a better possibility of detecting low concentrations of elements, or low percent abundant isotopes. We would also like to get analyte signal enhancement even when using the ICPMS in order to look better at low concentrations or low abundant isotopes. And finally, we want to see if we can get reduction of solvent-based mass spectral interferences. And these are interferences that are largely coming from injected water. Uh, so. Uh, obviously, those are the uh, sources for hydrides and oxides. So applications of this type of a system, and the one we're going to talk about today, are applications in geochemistry. In particular, we'll look at the first or top one, uranium series dating studies used in geochronology. There are also a number of other isotope systems um, that, of course, can be measured using this system with an ICPMS. Some examples are calcium, iron, hafnium, and so forth. I did mention um, semiconductor samples, and uh, these can include things such as high purity acids that are used in silicon wafer processing, and high purity solvents such as isopropyl alcohol. Some other applications that uh, this type of system has been used for also include pharmaceutical samples dissolved in an organic solvent, here again, we can use the membrane dissolvator to remove organic solvent vapor. And looking at very low levels of uh, particular elements in clinical samples, for example, there have been applications for looking at uranium and plutonium in urine. So a wide range of applications for the product, but we will concentrate on geochemistry uh, in this webinar. So first, here is a front view of the system. Uh, of course, we're going to show more details about this as we move through the webinar. I will just point out the dimensions uh, that are added to the bottom of this slide to give you an idea of approximately how large the system is. And we'll see more details when we show this set up on some contemporary uh, ICPMS systems. One thing I'll point out on the uh, upper left-hand side of the unit is where our sample uh, nebulizer uh, attaches into a spray chamber. The blue light on the bottom, which shows the name of the instrument, is used as a status indicator uh, that the system is uh, ready for use. So first, let's start with a side schematic just to show um, generally what the operation of the system is. So we have a 
uh, inert nebulizer uh, with the body made out of perfluoroalkoxy or a fluoropolymer, and that is generally self-aspirated. The self-aspiration can be manual, or the uptake line could be connected to a micro auto sampler for an automated run. And we'll look at an example of that toward the end of the webinar. The argon nebulizer gas, which is indicated by the arrow call out, will be coming from the host ICPMS instrument. So it'll be under control of that instrument's computer software. The nebulizer itself is then inserted into a port into a heated PFA spray chamber. Of course, we want to keep the sample aerosol in a vapor phase. There is a uh, port for a pump drain in case there is any liquid accumulation in the spray chamber. And the spray chamber is tilted backward to the front, and that helps prevent any liquid from moving toward the membrane dissolvator. That pump drain would typically then be hooked up to the ICPMS peristaltic pump. So moving uh, into the system then, you see the sort of hashed uh, blue area, and that depicts the heated fluoropolymer membrane, which is porous. Of note is we have something called an argon sweep gas, and this gas comes into the back end of the membrane and moves towards the front of the system around the outside of the membrane. And we're going to use that, and the, the term we use is counter current flow, meaning it's flowing in the opposite direction of the nebulizer gas to help remove any solvent vapor that permeates through the porous membrane and will remove that to vent. After the sort of blue shaded area then uh, will come our dried sample aerosol. One last expedient we can do is we can add a very low flow rate of nitrogen, and this is depicted as being added after the membrane. We would not add it before or in the middle of the membrane, else it would be lost. But that low flow of nitrogen then combines with the dry sample aerosol and then proceeds to the ICPMS torch, uh, and then that sample stream is then analyzed. We'll talk a little bit more, of course, about the, uh, uh, the, the nitrogen addition and the effects that it does have. So moving just from a size schematic diagram of what's going on in the system, I did want to show you a block diagram of the Eridus 3. And this points out some of these same main components that we talked about. In the left front side of the unit, you see the PFA spray chamber. It has a port to accept the nebulizer. There is a spray chamber oven uh, that's denoted and that, of course, heats the spray chamber to help keep the sample aerosol in a vapor phase. The membrane is inside a uh, membrane dissolvator block, which is heated, that also keeps everything in the vapor phase. Uh, in the front right corner, you see things that are denoted by MFC support plate and MFCs. Those are mass flow controllers and those help to regulate the flow of the argon sweep gas and the nitrogen addition gas. And those are very important for tuning the system and getting the best signal and most stable signal. So some more details on the operational characteristics of the system. As we've mentioned, the heated PFA spray chamber and the heated membrane dissolvator are there to maintain the nebulized liquid sample in a vapor phase. The argon sweep gas flow essentially establishes a humidity gradient across the membrane. So the argon sweep gas that's coming in and is flowing around the outside of the membrane is very dry. So that humidity gradient helps force the uh, uh, sample vapor to move across the membrane and then go to the exhaust uh, and, and be taken away and is no longer part of the sample stream that's heading towards the ICPMS. Finally, the nitrogen addition gas, as we showed in the earlier schematic, is introduced after the membrane dissolvator. And we'll see some numbers as we move through the webinar. This is a relatively low flow of nitrogen. It's added to the dry sample gas stream. And one of the um, uh, ways that it may help is it may enable better energy coupling between the induction region of the plasma, and that's the very hot, bright lobes of the plasma, 
and the central channel of the plasma. When it does that, of course, it helps increase ionization efficiency of the uh, uh, analyte elements that are being introduced to the central channel of the plasma. Of course, you can't add too much or too little. There is a right amount to add, and you would, of course, uh, observe that in, in the uh, ICPMS tuning. But um, it, it is an important part of the overall experiment, and um, uh, it, it usually will give you about a factor of two improvement in addition to the heated uh, sample aerosol when you use the, the system as a whole. There are instances, and I'll show those, where uh, you may not be able to use the nitrogen. Okay, So first, the sources of the argon, uh, the argon sweep gas supply can be from a separate argon source, uh, or it can be teed from the main argon supply for the host ICPMS. In practice, we'll see uh, mostly that argon supply will be teed from the supply to the ICPMS. The nitrogen addition gas supply is typically from a separate source, and it's often from a compressed cylinder, and we recommend that it should be at least 495 pure or better. Now, some details on the nitrogen addition gas. It can cause mass spectral interferences, especially at lower mass. So there are some examples, and there are a number of them there, uh, uh, detailed uh, argon uh, 40 plus nitrogen 14 on iron 54, and also on chromium 54, ARN2 on zinc 68. So those are things to be careful of. Um, if you're looking at any of those isotope systems. Instead, the nitrogen gas flow can be reduced or replaced with a low flow of argon, but there can be, uh, of course, loss of sensitivity because the nitrogen does improve that. Um, but for higher mass isotopes, things such as lead, uh, uranium, and thorium, the nitrogen uh, th does not cause an interference. And then I wanted to give you a reference for the nitrogen addition. Uh, this is a very good review article in Analytical Methods by Scheffler and Posebon about the advantages, drawbacks, and applications of using mixed gas plasmas, particularly argon nitrogen sources in both ICP emission and ICPMS. Uh, so this is a very good review to show the different applications where this is, has been used. So, back then to some of the hardware components uh, that we'll use in the Aridus 3. I did mention at first, the first main component is this inert nebulizer. And it's a PFA nebulizer per fluoroalkoxy, also with a fluoropolymer capillary. The nebulizer gas supply port uh, is for four millimeter tubing, which is very commonly used on ICPMS instruments. So your gas supply, that is controlled by the host ICPMS would attach there. The uptake line has an encapsulated carbon fiber support. That, is, of course, helps if you're either doing manually, manual sampling or if you're connecting this to a micro auto sampler. And I'll show you an example of that later in the presentation. Uptake rates by self aspiration are typically in the range of 50 to 200 microliters per minute with probably 100 microliters per minute being the most common flow rate to get the best sensitivity, but not use up too much sample and or allow enough sample to integrate for longer to improve the data quality. In the next slide you show here the uh, connection of the PFA nebulizer to the Aridus 3. So the port, there you see accepts a standard six millimeter diameter nebulizer and that simply inserts through the port and will seal against two fluoropolymer O-rings. There's also depicted the spray chamber drain line that would typically connect to the host ICPMS peristaltic pump. Uh, you can simply turn that on and leave it on in case there is any liquid buildup in the spray chamber. At low sample flow rates of say 50 or 100 microliters per minute. This is not very common. If you move up to the 200 microliter per minute, which is kind of the upper range for the system, there could be some liquid buildup 
or if you use the quick wash device for washing out the spray chamber, which I'll also show towards the end of the uh, presentation. Connections to the back panel, of course, we've mentioned the uh, argon sweep gas and the nitrogen addition gas power. These two gas flows, argon sweep gas and nitrogen addition gas um, computer uh, connection, which allows the mass flow controllers to be activated. And then the sample outline and the sweep gas outline all will attach to the back panel. In the middle of the picture, there is a little metal handle with a little heat sticker above it. Uh, that's the membrane desolvator modular block that can be easily removed from the system. And perhaps a later webinar will go over uh, maintenance tips and other things for the Eridus 3, uh, but that's what that denotes. So, but there you see the uh, uh, main connections that you would do that are on the back panel of the unit. So now moving to give a better idea of the dimensions and overall layout of the system. Uh, here are some uh, experimental work that uh, we did with a new instruments, multi-collector ICPMS. And because it was handy at the time, we simply placed the unit on top of the previous model, Eridus 2. And for those of you who have or are using an Eridus 2, that gives you some idea then of the dimensions of the Eridus 3. Uh, the footprint is a little bit less, so this allows a little bit better placement on carts and on sampling areas on uh, ICPMS instruments. Also, you see to the left is peristaltic pump, and uh, that was set up and simply turned on to drain or connect to the spray chamber drain uh, in case there was any liquid accumulation. Then on they are common uh, multi-collector ICPMS, uh, that being the Thermo Fisher Neptune. There you see the sampling area near the torch box um, for the Neptune. Uh, again, in this instance, we were again doing manual sampling, and there's also the peristaltic pump uh, just to the left and behind the Eridus 3 uh, to remove any liquid that might accumulate in the spray chamber. And again, in this instance, we were doing manual sampling. If you look in the middle of the picture, you can just see the uh, encapsulated carbon fiber uh, support, and we had placed the uh, uh, uptake line in uh, one of the samples in the uh, in the uh, tube holder rack that's on the sampling area. So, another point, and this is with regards to the sweep gas out, which is carrying the uh, removed sample solvent vapor out of the Eridus 3 so that does not go to the ICPMS torch, that will go down an insulated sweep gas outline into a trap bottle. Uh, we have a four liter trap bottle and that's usually placed on the laboratory floor next to the instrument. And then there's a vent outline that will go to an exhaust source. Uh, this will of course then condense and trap uh, the solvent vapor that is generated from the PFA nebulizer. So this is a place to collect that so it's safely removed from the instrument. Uh, we also want it in an area where it can't disturb any gas flows and cause any uh, uh, fluctuations in the signal. So the software, and I did allude to that, and you saw the uh, uh, communications cable that does connect to the back of the unit. Uh, this small screen uh, then will come up after you load up the software and it allows you to control the temperature for the spray chamber, the membrane desolvator, and the argon sweep gas and the nitrogen addition gas flows. Factory settings for the spray chamber and the solvator are 110 degrees centigrade and 140 degrees centigrade respectively. But you see on the right side, next to the boxes of the up and down arrows, the ranges of 30 to 130 degrees C for the spray chamber and 80 to 180 degrees C for the desolvator. So those can be adjusted depending upon the application. But we suggest 110 and 140 for a start. On the bottom of the screen are the controls for the argon sweep gas and the nitrogen addition gas. And the sweep gas range is quite large to allow a wide range of tuning, zero up to 12 liters per minute and up to 50 milliliters per minute for the nitrogen. 
So the nitrogen flow is considerably less than the argon sweet gas. And I'll give you some tips in the, in the uh, slides on tuning uh, where uh, that nitrogen addition gas flow typically is. Finally, there is a little bit uh, part of the uh, software control that says full control or ICP ignition. Um, if you click the ICP ignition on, uh, the gas controls will revert to one liter per minute for the argon sweet gas and 0.5 mil per minute for the nitrogen. This is so you don't have too much gas flowing through the system, which could cause a poor start of the ICP plasma. What you want to try to avoid there is any arcing, which could damage the torch or something like the guard electrode. Uh, you do want those gas flows turned down. Uh, when you start the plasma, and then you'll turn them back up when you start tuning um, the, the system before running samples. So tuning steps are on the next two slides, and uh, I'll point out the highlights of this, and I'm going to show you uh, some of the effects of the tuning steps actually graphically so you can see uh, more what's going on. So I said in the beginning, uh, we'll set the argon sweep flow to about one liter per minute and the nitrogen addition gas flow to a half a mil per minute or less before starting the ICPMS plasma. And again, that's to avoid having a rough start to the plasma or the plasma not starting at all. Once the plasma is started, we'll generally just set the PFA nebulizer gas flow to one liter per minute to start and then introduce your tuning solution. Usually for these systems, it'll be a part per billion solution the elements that it may contain could be cobalt, yttrium, indium, cerium, lead, uranium to the PFA nebulizer. Then you'll start to increase the argon sweep gas flow until a particular element, and one we usually look at carefully, is cerium. Um, that signal stops increasing, and the cerium oxide to cerium begins to go over 1%. The typical range for that is about 3 to 6 liters per minute of argon. And again, we're going to show what happens with that graphically. Then we'll introduce some of the nitrogen addition gas. A typical flow range, again, is relatively low, about 3 to 10 mils per minute. And we'll add the nitrogen until the tune element signals begin to level off or significantly decrease. Then we'll adjust the argon sweep gas flow, usually downward, until the cerium oxide to cerium ratio is about 0.1% or less. Often when we do this, and we'll again see this, the analyt uh, elements, examples in the Mysterium, will tend to increase in signal when we start to bring the argon sweep gas down. Okay, Then we'll adjust the PFA nebulizer gas flow for highest signal and lowest oxides. Uh, then usually we're looking, of course, to push the cerium oxide to cerium ratio below 0.1%. Now after we've done that, we need to go back to the ICPMS and we need to optimize the torch's XYZ sampling position, and we'll need to optimize the ICPMS ion optics for the highest signal. After we've done that, of course, we can go back and fine tune the argon sweep gas, nitrogen addition gas, and even the nebulizer gas for best signal and lowest oxides. Typically, the percent cerium oxide to cerium ratio, after you've run the system for maybe one or two hours, will typically be 0.05% or less. So graphically, and uh, I'll show you a number of these, uh, this was a quick scan that we did on a multi-collector instrument looking at signal for uranium-235. In this quick experiment, uh, the nitrogen was set at 3.9 mils per minute, so uh, a, a typical value for the nitrogen. And we went ahead and started varying the um, argon sweep gas flow to see what would happen with the signal. So you see at three, we didn't have very much. We moved it up to three and a half and then four, and we uh, optimize, or, uh, optimized out in signal. And then as we increased the argon sweep gas, then the signal started to go down. So that gives you a quick idea of the tuning profile. We'll look at these sort of optimization steps as we uh, change the argon sweep gas flow. Again, the argon sweep gas is flowing around the outside of the membrane. When I don't have that flow going around the outside, then 
uh, I'm simply not getting much sample gas or nebulizer gas then sent towards the ICPMS plasma. I'll have to have the right balance of flows inside the membrane and around the outside. The next experiments uh, show uh, more detail, and we did this on a quadrupole ICPMS system that we have here. And here we uh, have more variability in, uh, in this experiment, the argon sweep gas flow. And we initially set the uh, nitrogen flow at a relatively low rate, uh, 0.5 mils per minute, leaving that low, set the NEM gas at one, and just then went ahead and varied the argon sweep gas. We also increased the integration time to one so you could better see the plateaus for what is happening. So as we move from one to 1 1.5, two, 2.5 to three in the argon sweep gas flow, you see uh, very pronounced jumps in signal. Once I moved over three to about three and a half, then the signal started to tail off. So then I know, okay, uh, maybe I've added a little bit too much uh, argon sweep gas, and I'm going to have to move back to a little bit lower flow rate for optimum signal. So then moving on in the scan, I decided just to add sort of a normal amount of nitrogen, and I picked a range between 3 and 10, which is usually where we, we, we are at for the tuning, and set it at 6 mils per minute nitrogen. When I did that, and that's shown by the arrow, the signal actually went down. Okay. So then I went back to my tuning steps and started to move back on the argon sweep gas flow. And I did these in smaller increments, 3.25 down to 3, 2.9, 2.8. And you see the signal uh, markedly increasing. Then I went ahead and started to tune the nebulizer gas flow and set it at 0.90 liter per minute. So from where I started with the nitrogen to where I've ended with the sweep gas tune and the nebulizer gas tune, there has been a very pronounced increase in the uh, analyte signal. And you can see in the bottom bar in the bottom of the screen, um, I'm looking at uh, indium at mass 115, cerium at mass 140, and the cerium oxide to cerium ratio, which is 156 over 140. Right there, I'm right at about or just under 0.1%. I'm at 0.096%. So then I went ahead and did a full tune of the XYZ torch position, the ion optics. I checked the system resolution and allowed the system to warm up. And uh, then I got this very nice stable scan um, for uh, the indium and uh, cerium signal at one PPB at a one second integration time. And there you see the uh, oxide ratio had now settled into 0.03%, which is very good. So that means everything has been optimized. And if I was to use this system, I would go ahead and probably then start some, uh, some sample run. So those values there, again, are for this particular quadrupole system, NEM gas, argon sweep gas, nitrogen. They can be different depending upon um, the model ICPMS you're using. But it is important to note that once these gas flows and you have a good rough estimate of where they should be set, the other ICPMS parameters do need to be retuned. Uh, the torch XYZ position, the ion optics uh, do need to be reset. The values that you've been using, say, for wet plasma with the standard nebulizer and spray chamber often are, are different under dry plasma conditions. So now moving into some examples of using the system in geochemistry. Um, here's an outline for speleothems and uranium series dating. Uh, speleothems meaning cave deposit samples, and we'll look at a number of them in some pictures, and U-series dating based on the ratio of U-234 to two, uh, thorium-230 in a sample, where the thorium-230 is a decay product of uh, U-234. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. But just a brief outline of the sample preparation. Um, for these particular samples, the sample powder masses will generally range from about 20 to 100 milligrams. 
They're dissolved in concentrated nitric acid, and they're spiked with a mixed thorium and uranium uh, isotope solution. The samples are dried, redissolved in, in now diluted, uh, about one to one nitric acid. And these subsamples are added to anionic resin columns to separate out the uranium and thorium from the rest of the sample matrix. Once those are separated, these spiked aliquots that contain the uranium and thorium are taken up in 3% nitric acid and are then analyzed using the multi-collector ICPMS with the Eridus 3. One thing I'll mention about the uh, uranium series dating um, is that when these samples are formed, the uranium will be dissolved in the water. And uh, once the uh, uh, particular speleothermal cave deposit starts to form, uh, the uranium that was in the sample to begin with from the, from the water, which helped to create it, then starts to decay from the decay chain U238 to 234, then finally to thorium-230. Thorium in the beginning is not soluble in the water. So the assumption is that the sample, the cave deposit, started off as a closed system where it didn't start with any thorium, and whatever thorium uh, is generated is from the decay of the uranium that was originally there. So that's the basis of the measurement. These types of dating measurements usually are, are deemed useful up to about 500,000 years, largely based on the half-lives of, uh, of the isotopes that are involved in the decay series. So I do wanna also give you a reference um, that uh, you can also uh, look up uh, that describes this type of uh, geochemistry experiment from Cheng et al. in Earth and Planetary Science Letters. And that will go through uh, many more details of the sample preparation and the measurements used with multi-collector ICPMS to do this type of work on uh, speleothem samples. So let's look then at some of the sample types. So this first one is a stalagmite, which means that it was formed on the ground floor uh, of a cave. Um, this particular sample was drilled to screen its age. Uh, this was from Carlsbad Cavern, which is in southeastern New Mexico. And in the acknowledgement, I'll, I'll mention him, this sample was collected by Dr. Victor Poliak with a federal permit uh, to go into uh, Carlsbad Cavern National Park. The little scale on the picture shows you the approximate size of the stalagmite sample which was sampled off the floor of the cave. And the little mark in the middle was what was drilled off. And these are typically drilled off with a dental drill or a small Dremel drill. Um, and then that sample powder was collected and then processed per the uh, um, uh, steps on the uh, previous slide. So some of the results, and uh, these are what I'll just show is 130 milligrams of the powdered sample. It's a calcite, which is a carbonate. Um, and I'll note some of the, uh, of course, elements that are measured, the ratios that are measured as part of the calculation. But I'll point out the uh, uh, age corrected value, which is what we're looking at, was about 1,200 years. Um, so uh, a, a relatively young stalagmite. Uh, but these are, are some of the uh, things that will be measured, uranium levels, thorium levels, varying ratios, activity ratio, in order to come up with the, uh, the uh, corrected age of the sample. Another example of a, uh, of a calcite type is moon milk. This was also from the southwestern US in the Grand Canyon in Arizona. It's a cave-like deposit, again, a speleothem. It has sort of a toothpaste-like consistency that coats the wall of a cave. So a little bit different than a stalagmite. The same type of procedure was applied uh, to this type of sample, 50 milligrams. And the corrected age, again, about 1,500 years. So on the scale, typically a relatively uh, young sample type. But now we'll look at a couple of others that uh, we recently 
uh, collected some data for, uh, which are quite a bit older by the method. Here's an altered stalagmite. This is from a hidden cave on Guadalupe Mountains, also in New Mexico. Uh, we, uh, the sample was taken from that area of the stalagmite. There you can also see the scale on the sample. It's about 23,000 years uh, by this measurement method. So this was considerably older than some of the previous samples. And the last sample type that was also run by the same method. This one was sort of approaching um, the, the limit of the method, up around 450,000 years, was a stalactite straw that essentially kind of can grow into a stalagmite. Uh, the stalactite, of course, is coming down from the ceiling of the cave. Stalactite from the top and stalagmite from the ground or from the bottom. Uh, this was from Fort Stanton Cave, uh, also in New Mexico, but in the central part of the state. So summing up using the Eridus 3 for this type of work, um, we were enhancing our analyst signal about a factor of four to five, and that certainly makes analyses easier and faster. But the important takeaway point is that because of the enhanced sensitivity we have when we couple the Eridus 3 with the multi-collector system, is smaller masses of often limited and often very expensive to obtain samples can be analyzed. Uh, that, of course, allows more sample to be used for additional experiments. It also reduces uh, sample column chemistry time. Um, of course, you have to have more chemistry, more chemistry and more column time if you have to use larger masses of sample in order to simply get enough analyte to detect. In this experiment uh, of note, I'll mention that the Neptune multi-collector that was used was equipped with a jet sample and X interface cones, but unfortunately the high performance interface vacuum pump was down and not working. Uh, so we did very, very well even despite that. So perhaps in the future we might be able to look at experiments uh, once this pump is fixed and may be able to, uh, of course, get uh, even uh, uh, greater analyte sensitivity improvement. So certainly for the acknowledgement, uh, we want to thank Dr. Yamani Asmaram and Dr. Victor Poliak at the University of New Mexico Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences for their assistance in the tests of using the uh, Eridus 3 with the uh, Neptune multi collector. Um, of course, uh, it, uh, multi collector time uh, is important time. Um, and again, these samples, as I mentioned, are often expensive and difficult to collect. So we're very thankful that uh, we were able to run these uh, as examples. Now, um, a couple of other things that you can also add with the Eridus 3 that I did allude to is an auto sampler. And this is for uh, automated uh, analysis of, uh, of a sample sequence or a sample run. The ASX112 auto sampler was designed to fit on top of the Eridus 3. And there you see the uh, sample probe. And you can see the encapsulated carbon fiber mounted in the probe arm of the ASX-112, that's all one piece and is part of the PFA nebulizer that inserts into the spray chamber into the Eridus-3 at the bottom. Some details on the uh, sample vials and racks. Uh, if I open up the front door, uh, which you can do to load up the sample rack, What's commonly used is the 24 position central rack, which holds 1.5 milliliter PFA vials. Again, this is uh, all has to be polymer wear and often fluoropolymer wear in case uh, the samples do contain hydrofluoric acid. Uh, around the outside of the tray, you'll have uh, vials that can be used for tuning standards, uh, but the samples typically will be in the uh, central rack in the tray. If the larger sample volumes are available, uh, there are a couple of options there. Um, there's a 30 position Bellard half rack and a 42 position Bellard half rack that can also be placed in the tray to hold larger sample vials. 
Uh, we do have polypropylene vials, 14 mil and 7 mil available. Uh, there are often also PFA vials available on the market that could also be used. Um, and finally, um, on the last picture, I denoted the Quick Wash 3 accessory. Um, in uh, uh, coming months, I'll probably be generating some more information and data with regards to the uh, Quick Wash 3. This is an accessory, essentially to an accessory that you can add to the Aridus 3 to wash uh, the inside wall of the spray chamber without having to shut down the system, let it cool and pull the spray chamber out. Um, this is useful uh, when you want to continue a run. Otherwise, uh, again, you'd have to shut the system down, allow it to cool, and then pull the chamber out and then clean it if there's been sample matrix buildup uh, on the spray chamber. So, more information, there are a number of sources to go to. Uh, if you do have, say, an Aridus 2 or an Aridus 3, uh, there's the service support email, sales support if you're interested in a system or need any spares for the system, such as additional nebulizers. Technical support, uh, certainly myself at fred.smith at teledyne.com and paula.duscott at teledyne.com. And again, if you have any questions uh, about the webinar or after the webinar, uh, you can simply uh, email them to again to me at fred.smith at teledyne.com. Of course, there's more information on the website, uh, such as specifications for the system, more applications. Um, and there's the link uh, uh, directly to uh, the Aridus 3. Um, so with that, uh, that concludes the webinar. Uh, again, thank you for your time in attending. And again, if there are any questions, uh, please send them to uh, my email address shown here on the last slide. Thank you.